Hello, welcome to Research Jam number 19. Today we have four speakers. So each of them will take 10 minutes. We'll start with Alex. It's, Alex has been here, I don't know, feels like five times already. And every time he has a new model, a new web training interface, always something fancy. Always looking forward to Alex's presentation. Go for it, Alex. Thank you very much. Today I'm also having something new. Uh, so today I want to talk about my latest project, which I came up with on my way back from New Rips in December. So it was just like random thought about like, what if we can do this? And uh, I decided to give it a try and it looks like it works. So the idea is uh, outlined on the slide. So it is multi-crop lava model and uh, if someone doesn't know lava is a family of uh, this time is family or general approach for uh, decoder only language models and basically it so uh, overall how a lot of vision language models work so they have similar not architecture but approach so you use some vision encoder, usually contrastive, based on some sort of clip architecture, and you generate some token embeddings, which are in the same, uh, have the same shape as usual text embeddings, and you concatenate them together and pass them through your language model of choice. For example, for uh, in this specific case, in Pali 3 model, they used uh, an decoder model, but uh, Lava models, uh, on the other hand, uh, usually use uh, decoder-only models like Lama, Mistral, Phi, and uh, so on and so forth. And basically from that, you train your model to incorporate this vision representation into language model like space and uh, train the model to reason based on these vision embeddings. And as a result, you get the image, you get have a question and you get the answer. And uh, the problem I saw with uh, these models is that these models will have a hard time solving like complex tasks so that have a lot of uh, details in the images. And you may ask why. And the reason is that Try to answer what kind of shop is advertised on this board based on this specific image, because it is originally was very high dimensional, like 4,200 by 2,800. But for neural network, we have to shove it into very low resolution, 300 by like 384 by 384 representation. And then we ask our model answer this question, but it is physically impossible to do so. And uh, any prediction that the model will make will be purely random guess. And uh, how usually one way to solve this problem is upscale the input into neural network. So we can uh, get from uh, 300 to 700, sometimes maybe 1000 in some rare cases, but it is like, it is better, but still from, even this image, which is uh, 768 by 768, you cannot get the information you need to answer the question. Another solution I saw is very impressive thing, which is uh, called like iterative search. So basically authors of this paper, guided visual search, literally guide the model through the image by uh, having these contextual cues. And eventually the model basically like looks for some cues and uh, makes the area uh, of the image, which it analyzes smaller and smaller until it reaches area where it gets object from which uh, it can answer the question, which is very, very good. And authors showed that it works very well. But I asked a question like, can we do the same thing, but without this iterative search using pure attention. 
because we already have attention mechanism in transformers. So can we just make the model attend to proper visual tokens to get the uh, right answer? And uh, the approach I came up with is basically we have one high-res image, and then we cut it into multiple uh, crops, multiple pieces. Then we calculate uh, image embeddings from every single of these crops. And then we convert these Im representations into token embeddings. But we generate uh, not N tokens, not hundreds of them, but we can generate like one, two, like small number of them. And then we use them in the very same way as in other uh, models like Pali or Lava. We use them uh, in concatenation with uh, regular text tokens. Hey, Alex, can I ask yeah, of course. why generate yeah, of a course. different number of tokens? Why only M? Uh, because if we generate, for example, a regular number of tokens, so for every single crop, we will generate, for example, 700 tokens. Mm -hmm. And if we have uh, like 20 or 30 tokens, we will have 14,000 tokens just for the image. And transformers having uh, n square complexity, it will just blow your GPU. So just for efficiency, you want yes. to... Yes, okay, I got it. Yeah. And the model I came up with, it is like standard Lava approach, is a language model, but it is smaller than usual. It is phi2, which has 2.8 billion parameters. It is smaller than people usually do because usually they start with 7 billion, like LAM or Mistral. But I saw very successful models and very like high performing models that use even smaller models like phi 1.5, which has 1.6 or 1.5 billion parameters. So even smaller models are quite capable of doing uh, of in Lava setup. And for vision model, uh, I used uh, Siglip vision encoder, which for like for me is like the best uh, vision encoder, clip based vision encoder nowadays because it is very like rather small it is has only 400 million parameters but it performs like better than anything of the similar size and better than most of the models of larger size and for and to vision and uh, text i use standard lava two layer multi layer perceptron as the in original model and then i train it and as a result, I got very good results. So these are very latest results, which I got uh, just like this weekend, because since we have very complex, like more complex architecture and for every single image, we have multiple crops. And if I want to train vision encoder along with text, uh, along with language model, I have to basically generate for every single image a lot of crops and every single crop will generate its gradients. And because of that, it requires a lot of computational resources to train vision encoder along with language model because of just like sheer number of gradients that are generated uh, during training. Yeah, so it takes a lot of resources, a lot of time to train. Uh, but these numbers that I got in first four benchmarks, they are just like good numbers for models of this size. It is not like state of the art. It is uh, like latest Lava model or just other language, uh, vision language models. So they have higher numbers. This, but this visual uh, star benchmark, which was specifically created to test the model's performance on high resolution images with some small details. This model performs better than anything except for GPT-4 vision and the framework that I mentioned earlier that was designed to solve these kind of tasks. So they created benchmark to test their approach, their model, because there was no benchmark for these like high resolution images. And maybe you are still interested to know like what was written on the sign, what was written on the advertisement board and what kind of shop is this. 
and uh, this is uh, was written what was it, it is a yoga shop and uh, this is the output from uh, from my model it correctly answers that the shop is a yoga studio in some instances it can so it obviously reads yoga it understands this but sometimes it uh, reads a parts of this text it can output like power of yoga leave yoga so it can output uh, some combinations of the words from this specific uh, board and also I made for these images I made like ablation study I just went and removed everything related to this shop from this image and the model couldn't predict the, the model couldn't tell what kind of shop it is so it definitely reads the sign it definitely understands these small details from the image and another example is here like you have very cluttered room and you ask the model what is the color of the cup just just cup without any details and it is capable of finding like this specific cup and answering that this cup is blue and and again if i move this cup from the image it answers that the cup is white probably just because there are a lot of white objects here this is like ongoing work but latest results which i got they motivate me that like they tell that the model is quite good and i will yeah be working on uh, like technical report or paper about it thank you super cool yeah really cool anybody have any questions for alex so you can totally create your own benchmark when you said that they're not enough benchmarks with high resolution images where there are little things that you need to detect you can create a little sign with words on mm -hmm. it, just like digitally, and then embed it into like a random huge landscape image and ask the model to find the sign and read the words. Yeah. What all, I also found that the model is not like at least my model that I work on, it is not very good at reading like text, mm -hmm. like especially like sm small text. So for example, here on the on this image, it can read yoga, it can leave, read like leaf, power, like all these things. But when I tried to ask it about like some small details on other images, for example, in this VSTAR benchmark, basically like both of these images are taken from VSTAR benchmark, which mm -hmm. they created for answering questions for, for high res and very detailed images. And, uh, for example, if there was something written on this cup, the model likely wouldn't be able to answer what is written on the cup. So it, like, it has limitations, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think I can either extend VSTAR benchmarks, so add a bit like more data to it to make it bigger and maybe like cover more cases because it is, like, it is good, it is, it has a 200 images in total, maybe a bit 240, yeah, 240 images of different types. For example, in some cases, you need to read something from uh, from the bag or from the cup, from something. If yeah. we need, uh, if it would be useful, I wonder if you could take existing benchmarks, use some visual like in painting algorithm to like extend the borders, but have the same <laughs> question apply. Maybe put put the original in that is full mm -hmm. resolution but then have the borders be larger. Yeah. Like the, uh, there are a lot of, like there are tons of high res images around the internet. It it will just take time to like go through some of them and find like, like some interesting details you can ask the model about. And also- I guess, I I guess you, could, you could take any existing kind of VQA style benchmark and use the same labels, but just expand the picture, right? Maybe the label creation yeah. process is the expensive part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we should wrap up. We're over <laughs> 15 minutes now. Uh, so let's thank thank Alex again. Okay, very interesting. Where's the anyone? Yes, next up we have Paul talking about CNN source random filters. Yes. All right, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me. My name is uh, Paul Gaflikov, and I'm a fourth year PhD student in uh, Offenburg in Germany. And what I'm going to present you today is a part of a paper that we unsuccessfully tried to submit to many conferences last year. And I was 
generally hoping for um, some feedback and maybe somebody wants to um, join and collaborate on this and take it further than it is today. So what uh, we're interested in as a group uh, or what, what was also a large part of my uh, PhD thesis is uh, studying what CNNs learn, how they see the world, and it builds on uh, very old works by one of the organizers here, which I think dates back to 2014. There's been also a lot of work by OpenAI and Anthropic in this area, which is kind of mechanistic interpretability. And then I was also very lucky that uh, my first paper was accepted as a oral to CBPR 22 where we analyzed a large model zoo of CNNs and tried to see whether there are similarities in the filters that they learn. And it turns out, yes, um, this is beyond what I'm going to uh, show you today. So there are many reasons why you would actually study learned weights, uh, and in particular filters in, in, in models. The reason could be interpretability, but it could, you could also regularization. So you could try to push these filters to some kind of representation to maybe improve learning, maybe to make your model more robust or whatever it is. And then there's also a large amount of work that tries to initialize CNNs better. So you try to kind of not randomly initialize your network, but find some representation that is, is better. And we were also aiming for this direction. And um, in this area, what people usually do is they look at three times three convolution layers or any filter that is two dimensional. And for the large part, they actually ignore uh, what's uh, what's left in the network. And I, I made a simple sanity check on this. Um, and for this, I want to show you a part of a ResNet, which is kind of how all modern networks, all modern CNNs are sort of based on. And if you look at it, then uh, you will see that there is a convolution layer, of course, the, with a kernel shape of three times three. But there are also convolutions before and after that. So they're con pointwise convolution because they're just a single element. And for a large part, when people analyze the filters, they tend to ignore these two layers. And the assumption that they usually make is that the three times three layer is the important part and everything else is kind of forgettable. But let's invert the scenario. Um, let's take a network, learn all the parameters, and freeze this three times three layer to a completely random initialization that is never changed throughout learning uh, and see, because if, if this layer is so important, then freezing it should have a very decremental impact on your accuracy. And if you do this, for example, in the ResNet 50, then you actually turn off 50% of the parameters. So roughly, I think 10 million parameters of 25 are completely inactive and don't do anything in your network. And we did some experiments on ImageNet. So uh, we did two scenarios. We train all the filters and all the parameters, which is an orange. And the other experiment is we only train everything except the three times three filters. And if you do this for a ResNet 18, then you will get uh, usually an accuracy of, I don't know, 72%. And if you train with these random frozen filters, you are below 40%, which is maybe still impressive because uh, a large part of the network is not doing anything reasonable, but there is a huge gap between fully trainable networks and these random networks. And uh, the reason I already teasered uh, this is that they don't have one times one convolution. So what happens if we look at networks that have one times one convolutions like mobile net, like ResNets and pretty much everything that followed after that. Then you will see that in these networks, the gap between training all the parameters and only training everything but the three times three is actually relatively small. So for example, if we take the ResNet 50 again, you will see that we have uh, an accuracy of 75% uh, on ImageNet, which is quite good, I would say, even though that 50% of the parameters are never touched, they're never learned. And for a large part, they're not doing reasonable stuff. So in this paper, we try to analyze why this is, and uh, we try to kind of understand it from a perspective of linear combinations. If we look back at this residual layer, and we look at the three times three and the one times one that follows immediately, and we forget about the ReLU in between, then we can actually reformulate it as a linear combination of the weights and then do a convolution with those weights. So this is mathematically completely equivalent and you can shift it back and forth no matter how you want it. And this explains that 
if you have sufficiently many random filters, you can pretty much recombine them into a reasonable filter that is able to kind of transform your data into something useful. And of course, the more filters, uh, the more linear combinations you have, the more likely it is that you're able to reconstruct this. So um, we took a closer look at um, the scenario where we have a three times three without a ratio in between and a one times one after that. And what we tried to do is we scale the linear combination. So the rate, the number of linear combinations that you have in between without really increasing um, the, the network capacity. A bit hard to come to explain in the short time that I have here, but there are some details in the paper. And then we do two scenarios. Uh, one scenario where we train all the parameters again, on, uh, only a scenario where we train the one times one and everything else, and uh, the baseline comparison. And it turns out that if we make this linear expansion large enough, of course, eventually these random frozen ones will meet the baseline. That's kind of to be expected because if you have sufficiently many random things, you can construct everything else. But the interesting part is that beyond that, you actually start to outperform the baseline. So you're slightly better in validation accuracy. It's not a huge boost, but nonetheless, a significant boost. And we also measure this uh, across multiple seats. So this is not just one random phenomenon. And the other thing that's interesting, interesting about it is it also improves your robustness against very light adversarial attacks. So there you can see like the wider we go on the X axis, the more robust we get. And eventually we significantly outperform uh, the baseline again. Hey, Paul, can I ask a question? On the first, yes. um, on the first, the leftmost plot validation accuracy, yes. you have the baseline and then you have the learnable orange point on the left at LC expansion one. Yes. Wouldn't those be the same? Is that the not like the null of the LC expansion? No. Um, so for the baseline, we wouldn't have any one times one convolutions at all. And for the learnable at LC one, it's uh, actually including this uh, this one time one layer. Okay. So we specifically okay. took an architecture that doesn't have any uh, one times one by default. Okay, thanks. Right. And uh, so <laughs> this was uh, rejected at uh, quite a number of conferences last year. Uh, we got incredibly diverse feedback. Uh, some reviewers liked it. They thought this is intriguing, interesting, and so on. And some other reviewers completely hate it. It's uh, either they state it's not surprising or it's trivial or well-known. There's also the type of feedback that you get where they say, okay, why are you even studying CNNs? Everybody has moved on to WITS. So what's the point? And um, some of these reviews were maybe justified, others were not. It's it's really hard to improve this paper. There were so many different things that were asked, and we're kind of not sure where to take this paper from here. But just to summarize, um, so what we did is kind of have the sanity check. We showed that if you do not include this one times one in your analysis or initialization or regularization paper, then it's a very dangerous thing to do because you ignore a very powerful operation in your CNN. And uh, we provide a, um, an explanation for this, which is this linear combination that you approximate. And we also show that if you take this to the extremes, then you actually are able to outperform training in uh, clean and robust accuracy. And in the paper, we also have a couple of more um, details where we actually show that the current way you initialize kernels is not really great if you take it beyond three times three kernels and a lot of modern CNNs are actually trying to increase the kernel size so maybe this is something that uh, needs to be studied yeah and with this I'm at the end I thank you very much for your attention and again if you, you have any question or feedback or ideas where we can take this from here or want to collaborate then please feel free to reach out to me thanks this is a good work I was thinking maybe you can try to compare it with wits like that what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of hard because bits, uh, I mean, they, they don't really have convolution filters, right? So what I was thinking is there are a lot of hybrid networks today, like ConfMixer or even ConfNext is based on this idea of patching. So maybe it makes mm -hmm. sense to go in that direction. But um, on the other hand, in the paper, we have so many architectures. <laughs> it's like reviewers will always ask for another architecture, but there is a point where it just doesn't make sense to scale it anymore because the we have a mathematical formulation and it's universally true, independent of what kind of architecture you train it on. So that's kind mm -hmm. of the thing um, that I'm that I'm stuck with. But nice, but maybe this is a good work. Thank you.
I wonder how much of it this uh, discovery is three by three specific. In the VIT case, I think if you set some visual embeddings to be random and then just allow the, the rest of the network to be learned, probably have similar findings. We were just looking for something that's other than three by three convolutional filters. So, so this is one thing that we also analyzed in this paper. It really applies to three times three. And of course, this was kind of the dominant thing for probably the last 10 years or so. If you take your kernels larger, then it will struggle to recombine it into useful filters because usually the filter learns the center elements of, of the filter. And as the filter grows larger, you will have a lot of zeros around the edges and you can really model this by linear combinations well. So this is one thing it struggles with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I mean is um, extending it to even beyond convolution and in the transformer based models, just setting some embeddings to be random. But I agree. Uh, I think it, um, it's an absurd ask to go beyond what you're already studying the architecture, but I know that's that would satisfy reviewers, is what I'm saying. Okay, yeah, maybe you can try this. Um, I'm not really that familiar with bits. I guess it's time to get familiar with them. <laughs> so maybe this is actually a good chance, yeah. Hello, oh, thanks. thanks for Hello, the talk. Hello. I'll just finish quickly. Super. Super Hello, I'm, yeah, it's Shubh Shankar. So uh, I could uh, give a suggestion. Uh, I work in visual modeling, and uh, ResNet is a very well studied model in terms of visual modeling. Visual modeling okay. is like uh, how the human brain processes visual uh, visual information. So mm -hmm. that's the domain. So you can actually like try to uh, use another data set that uh, kind of um, uh, like instead of uh, doing a classification task, we kind of do a regression task where we uh, generate neural responses instead of uh, just the class labels, right? So you can actually like uh, do the same task, but with uh, for neural responses, thereby uh, justifying that, okay, uh, does the human brain actually perform any kind of task that uh, uses one cross one convolution? This is just uh, a suggestion from my side because this should be a huge breakthrough in the field of neuroscience. So can you can you point me maybe to some paper or something where I can read into this? Sure, 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 sure. I'll I'll just uh, like uh, copy paste the uh, paper name of the paper in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. I was just saying, um, thanks for the presentation. Interesting work. Um, it's always hard to know how to best interpret reviewers, including some who seem to have unfair criticisms, but some probably have worthwhile you know, thoughts and criticisms of the work. Um, just, I guess some general suggestions. One is I would try to be really clear. Like, what is the story? What is the, what is the story of the paper? What beautiful underlying story about how these networks are working? Did you uncover? And just like telling that as cleanly as possible and ignoring everything else. So summarizing the very large number of experiments you did in terms of a simpler story. And I guess second, that story should include experiments and results that are kind of falsifiable. So I think some papers get lost in like, we changed 30 things about networks. We tried 30 different combinations of frozen and unfrozen and one by one and three by three and linear, ReLU layers replaced with linear layers. And some of them worked a bit better and some of them worked a bit worse. Like that story, that set of results is believable even without running any experiments. So it's not very, really very falsifiable. Um, so I would say tr trying to find the underlying story and trying to find a story, a narrative that is falsifiable, and then you show that in fact it, it does it does hold. Okay. So that's pretty generic, yeah. I guess. But thank you very much. I think uh, yeah, the story is something that we struggled with. We had a lot of experiments and kind of finding something that connects them all was was really hard. Any other last questions for Paul? All right, we're pretty much at fifteen minutes, so let's thank Paul again. Let's move on to Deepak, talking about an RFP. Hello everyone, I'm Deepak. Uh... I'll talk about Meta. This is my first online uh, presentation of any kind. So we are uh, looking forward uh, for your feedback or any collaboration to enhance the quality of our work and make it publish, publishable. So first, I'll talk about what is movement intention and what is the brain images. So if there is a person who is imagining some, some movement, then we can take the recording of, uh, practical recording of uh, different parts of the brain which is called EEG recording and pass through a decoder, which can decode uh, those recordings and make it 
and translate into some kind of control signal so that we can make some prosthetic or some assistive devices uh, from that. So this is well explored area in brain computer interfaces. So I am applying meta learning to this, and our assumption is to consider each person as a different task because each person. So the problem in this domain is that each person has different type of data. So if we train on a pool of data, then there will be negative learning. I'll discuss in the next slide. So recently a paper uh, came uh, from CCD's lab where they are using these brain recording to control robots. Also, you can see in this uh, visual. So will we? Uh, so we are in this work. We applied a model of machine meta learning and reptile based meta learning. So the problem uh, with existing uh, neural decoder is that if we use randomly initialized neural decoder, we need a lot of data, and it is very time consuming to collect a uh, lot of data. One solution comes is to use pool of participants, but with them again there is a problem of negative uh, learning. Let me use the point. So the problem with this uh, transfer learning approach is if we train on a pool of data, then there is a issue of inter and inter subject variability. So signal of one person is very much different from the second person. So we cannot use them. So here uh, we propose an approach which is based on meta learning, where we first we we do not take or train the model directly on all the subject data. We just take the pool of uh, those people's data and then construct some meta task and then do meta training on those tasks and then uh, then fine tune that model on uh, new subject data. And this approach works better than all the previous approaches. I'll talk about this approach in detail here. So we are using uh, BCI 42A dataset, which has eight subjects. And uh, which is to, in total nine subjects, and then uh, these are the details, which is not very much required uh, from ML perspective. So uh, let's suppose if the person is imagining four movements: left hand, right hand, leg, and tongue. So if we have two examples for each of the four classes, so in total we have eight training data points, and we want to classify for new example. So what we'll do is from the previous eight subjects. We'll make support set and query set in the same way, the way we want to classify, it. and then we'll do meta training on these support sets, and then try, uh, try to make our model adaptable. Uh, here is the algorithm. I'll talk about in detail in the next slide. So we we want to make a generalized decoder so that we when we train this model on very small support set that is just only eight data points, and if one data point is of three seconds, then in twenty four seconds. We can adapt one person to this model, which was which was impossible in the uh, un randomly initialized decoder. So we will take this initial untrained decoder, and from all of the subjects, we will make subset of the from from all the previously available eight subjects, we will make three subsets. From each subset, we will take each subject and then make a copy of this model like this. And then train each of these decoder on the support set. And after training on the support set, we'll we'll pass on the query set and then calculate the loss on the query set. And this calculated loss on the query set will be propagated back uh, to this initial untrained decoder. And then this initial untrained decoder is updated with with some other value by gradient descent. And then we will we'll have uh, five one as our new parameter. Now this process is again repeated multiple times. So the initialization of this decoder is updated multiple times so that overall overall average loss on all of these subjects is decreased. So instead of training this model to uh, decrease loss on pool of subjects, we are trying to decrease the loss on average of all the subjects. So it is not uh, not getting tuned to certain type of subjects or the subject which are having more data or something. So which was the problem with a uh, previous decoder that is negative learning and The good part of this is now when it is well trained on all of the subjects, we can just easily adapt from very limited amount of data to the new person. Uh, so here are some results from our experiment which we did. So if we apply uh, the transfer uh, learning based approach, so on ten shots we get fifty nine percent accuracy, but we apply meta learning based approach, we get sixty three percent accuracy, three percent accuracy. And uh, in detail, if we just see the results, so Sorry for a lot of data on the screen, but if you just see here on the ten shots, there is a 
difference in the accuracy of each subject, subject each person, because as I said, there is a difference in the data of each person. But, but as you see, as the shots are increasing, the difference in the accuracy is decreasing, and which is a very interesting thing. We also did experiments with the inner loop and freezing and unfreezing. So we observed that as we increase the inner loop iteration, the accuracy increases, but still certain extent after loop, inner loop iteration four, it decreases. It again start decreasing, decreasing. And if we compare freeze and unfreeze, uh, freezing the ex feature extractor while adapting. So if we unfreeze the feature extractor while adapting, it increases the accuracy. The reason behind this is because the new person's data is very, very different to the data it was trained on. So during adaptation, we need to unfreeze all the layer and then train the model on, and then fine tune the model on that new person data. So this is it. And we need your help to enhance the quality of the data so that we can make it publishable. We published this part of this work to Tiny ICLR, but we couldn't make it a full paper. So any help or mentorship will be highly helpful. Thank you so much. Interesting uh, research here. So I was thinking, how did you, uh, EEG signals uh, have high no noise. So how, how did you uh, come up with uh, trying to separate that noise from here? Yes, yes. So that is a very, very prominent problem uh, with this. That's why you see the accuracy is uh, somewhere 60%, 70%, not too high. So we applied mm -hmm. some of the existing pre-processing pre techniques. And this data set which we took is well explored data sets in the case of uh, EPI. So they have uh, recorded this data with all the precautions, but it has a lot of uh, noise. That's why the accuracy is uh, so low in comparison to the ML image net classification and all of them. You didn't face uh, much disturbances in the architectural point of view from the meta learning perspective. Since uh, meta learning, uh, so we applied model linguistic meta learning, which is like model independent. So we use the uh, well explored EEG net architecture, which is made, made exclusively for the EEG kind of data. So we have mm -hmm. not done experiment on the architecture. We just did experiment on the algorithm okay. part. I wanted to ask, like, how did you handle overfitting? Because since you're using Q-shot meta learning, so mm -hmm. wasn't overfitting an issue? Actually, this. EGNet architecture is very small, just four layers of CNN. So the architecture is very small. So that's why there is not much overfitting here. Mm -hmm. okay. Since this is from a different domain, I can consider those easy images to be metrics. And now any mentorship you can provide us to make this work publishable will be highly helpful. Deepak, you mentioned that you presented this at Tiny iClear 2023. Yeah. Um, is this also, is it online somewhere? Is it actually posted? Yes. But that's, that's like a two page papers, but uh, IPAG wants to extend it to a full, full paper, an eight page paper somewhere. Yes, we applied this on multiple data sets and multiple meta learning disorders on like reptile and this and got better result on all of them, but how to make it better. Anyone have any last minute questions for Deepak? Hassan's mm -hmm. asking what size is the data set Deepak? So we have total, we have nine person data. One person has 144 images per class. So it is 144 into four classes. And the shape of the data is 22 cross 1001. I have a, a, a suggestion here. Uh, there, sure. there is a Kaggle competition, uh, HMS harmful brain activity classification. Maybe you come across that. The data set there. Maybe you should try your EEG model and see what differences or new techniques that they have dis discovered up, up till now. And they Because Chris Dreyot and uh, some others have shared no notebooks, which maybe try to argument some tech techniques. So uh, refer there if uh, you can get some ideas some from, from, from there. It will be helpful. Thank you so much. If you can share the link in the chat box, that's highly helpful. Okay, cool. I will share it. Thank you, man. Jason and Rosen, if you have any suggestion, like how we can go ahead. Just one thought here. Um, you have basically played around a bit with this data set and with some model tweaks, and you found things that tend to work well. Your table of results seems to indicate your, your approach works fairly well. 
Um, one path you could take this work is to just take your intuition that you've built so far and the specific modeling changes you've proposed and then take it around to a few new data sets and just try to be state-of-the-art on those data sets. You could even go to those new data sets, maybe other EEG data sets, and um, start from scratch trying to beat state-of-the-art, but in that process, try these methods that you've proposed. In general, if you beat state-of-the-art on a data set or a couple, it's hard to hard to ignore, and those types of papers tend to get in, these types of modeling papers. Um, you might find that your method needs to be changed a bit in the path to make to beat state of the art, and then you can maybe change it, and the final paper looks a little bit different. Or you may find that it works out of the box, and now it's suddenly worth the full paper. Thank you, Deepak. Maybe we move on to our last speaker, Hassan. Okay, uh, so the title was the um, collaborative, collaborative idea, but essentially, um, can we play God? Can we generate out of distribution DNA? So this is this is a project that's re that's recently kicked off. However, it's been in the works for the past couple of months. So uh, a quick plan on what DNA is. Hopefully, everyone knows what it is. But essentially, it's uh, it encodes DNA encodes genetic information. It usually consists of four pairs, uh, four base uh, four bases. It can consist of five bases, and sometimes there's other information for the type of base it could be. So there'd be a different letter um, rather than T if it's either T or G, right? Uh, sequences encode information, but they also form structural support. Topology matters. A single base in the right or wrong location can have major effects on an organism's viability. So take a virus, for example. If you swap out certain viruses, a single base pair, it can result in whether the, um, the gene that encodes for a protein that takes that virus shape actually comes into fruition. Um, for other organisms, such as us and um, Animals of various um, of larger size, it's less prone to errors on a specific uh, single base. However, it can result in issues, I think Down syndrome is, and a change within four bases, if I remember correctly, but I might uh, be mistaken here. So models must take into account both local and global information. Average sequence length for a species can range from 5,000 base pairs to 150 billion base pairs. And the whole experiment of a DNA is, is 0, 0 0.63. And um, the Hearst parameter, which is the predictability, is 0 0.8. Um, I've just done the calculations for one, one family of viruses. I've not extended for the entire viral data set, nor have I extended for the whole um, genome that we have in the NCBI. Um, before I move on, does everyone know what the whole exponent is or the Hurst parameter? Just, yeah, her, um, the whole exponent is the self similarity of a piece of, um, of, a, of a sequence, and the Hurst parameter is the predictability. So um, the higher the self-similarity, the, um, the more that one section is kind of familiar, similar to another. It's like, it might be the um, Brownian motion, right? Um, too high might be too difficult. The Hertz parameter, if it's too high, it just means essentially, it, if it, um, it, it's a score between 0 and 1, with 0 0.5 being um, completely random, if it hits 1, it's essentially the same. So it's like A throughout. So there is a bit of signal and noise in, in viral DNA. So what's the current state of the art in terms of the models? So we have HINA, DNA BERT, nuclear, nuclear, Nucleotide uh, Transformer, that's the GPM, uh, GNLM, and Grover. Most of these models have a context window ranging from uh, 512 at the lowest to a million at the highest for the HINA DNA. Uh, the HINA DNA is an SSM, the DNA BERT is an encoder, the Transform is a encoder. Um, the GPN is an encoder. GNLM um, is a family of encoder models, although they are creating decoder models too. Grover is an encoder model. Data set size, uh, sizes range from 3.1 billion for HINA and at the highest is at 1 trillion for the nucle nucleotide transformer, which is trained on a multi-species multi from the NCBI data set. I think it's 17, it's 37 species, although um, I might be incorrect. So, uh, so the plan, what, what data are we going to be training on in terms of our model? We are looking to um, gather all the, all the um, fully sequenced genomes on NCBI as well as the other nucle nucleotide uh, databases. There's 15,000 eukaryote species fully encoded, um, plants, there's 812 plants. Each um, plant on average have 1.2 billion uh, base pairs, 
virus is significantly smaller. They have an average of 10,000 base pairs. Most virus, uh, viral families are covered, which is great for validating our first set of experiments. We'll just be focusing on viruses. The second experiments will be extending will be other eukaryote species and families, which will hopefully be around 10 trillion tokens. Just to give a rough estimate, um, the, uh, for a virus, um, uh, to give a rough estimate of sizes, for a human being, you're looking at 2 billion tokens. So although it's 10 trillion tokens, it really isn't that much. It's just around, again, 15,000 species, with a lot of species on the lower end, um, some on the slightly higher end. The largest trees have 150 um, billion base pairs. So how will we validate? So visually, so there's a, a bunch of different methods. You've got the spider representation, H curves, C curves, you've got the color square, um, 2D lines, which is shown here. And then you've got FCRGR, uh, so that's the um, that's frequency chaos. So it's um, chaos, chaos represented, um, chaos generated views. Uh, so that's essentially you take a K-mod and then you look at how many times that K-mod comes up in a sequence. So it's, um, it's length independent. It's, it depends on the game for the FCGRs. For the 2D line, similar, it's you uh, give each uh, base a number, and depending on the number, you plot it, and then you see the full genome. So, um, for example, for the Alhambra, you can see that uh, it matches both, uh, most uh, viruses that have been sequenced for the Alhambra match both locally and globally. So there is a global pattern as well as a local pattern. Adenoviruses, which are a lot more diverse, have a different um, uh, shape and slope. The reason being, these, uh, these, this set of adenoviruses affect, um, if I remember correctly, bovines, and this is human adeno. So it's a, it's a completely different shape. It's a completely different species. However, the overall pattern is still there. And yeah, so that's the uh, visual representation. Numerically, you've got KL divergence, you've got persistent homology, again, because uh, you expect Viruses, which are viruses or DNA in general, which is similar to have a uh, to be homo homologous, right? And then based on that, you can do like uh, KMO and then bring it. They're the ones that are closer together, should have uh, should be related to each other. So if you were to generate a sequence, it should be in the same ish area. Then this method that's uh, taking both local and global information local by looking at the sequence that's two steps in front and two steps behind, and then giving that a weighting and then look looking at uh, normalizing that across the full sequence and then um, taking average and um, yeah and then seeing that for the global uh, from global view as well as the local and then assigning two different scores and then seeing where the, if seeing if they are close in, uh, in matching so yeah so first set of experiments with uh, the transformer models have already been created so um they will work on creating the ssm and the wavelet, mo uh, wavelet models after so we'll be um, we'll have we'll start with parameter of one million, go all the way to two hundred, and then uh, context window starting at forty eight, going up all the way to seven hundred sixty eight. All, all of them will be trained on the three point uh, three billion tokens of viral DNA that we have, except um, adenoviruses, which will be held back, and then we're going to see um, if those models are able to generate out distribution sequences, right? So rather than just is it are those models just learning, or are they, are they just memorizing, or are they learning? And then hopefully, if we're able to see that both the um, transform and non-transform models are to learn, then we can extend the, the scale of the experiments. Loss is she similar to, or uh, close enough to a transform model, hopefully. Uh, closeness is relative to a simple model, polynomial and harmonic means, and that's for the 2D representation of the generated sequences. For the other um, uh, what they call methods, we're just going to look at the actual scores. They should be similar-ish. Again, that is contingent on experiments. Models should be able to tell if a specific base is of a lower quality. This is very important for safety. If a if uh, a base is if, if if a base is at the wrong place, it can result again in in really dangerous um, outputs. The difference between COVID and like uh, COVID and another another virus that is in the same. It's, I think usually around five um, or two hundred base uh, bases which again, it's, it's small, but it's, um, it makes a huge difference. Uh, uh, once um, we've done with the initial experiments, we're hoping to scale the best scoring from non-transform models. The first uh, set of models will be order, order specific. Let me just go back so you can see what, what order is. So if you were looking at um, every organism, it starts off on the phylum, and then you've got your class, and then you've got order, family, genus, and species. 
if we're looking at us as humans, we start off as Homo sapiens, our genus is Homo, our family is primates, and then I think our order is monkeys, although I might be incorrect on that, and then class is the one directly above, and then phylum. Okay, um, yeah, so we'll start off with order specific and then extending to a general model, depending on the results of the order, um, depending on the results from the order specific models. Training on 10 trillion tokens for the final model, of, although the number of tokens we do train on will be contingent on the results from the first experiment. If we're able to learn without, that, without a lot of tokens, by like based on numerical and visual uh, representation of the sequence, then hopefully we can reduce the amount of tokens it needs to be trained on. Um, we will fine tune for safety. Again, this will be dependent on the data, set, data sets we're able to create. Fine tune on um, description of a sequence as well as the sequence itself. So, an actual just a like natural language description, similar to our channel, right? So, you give, oh, I want a sequence that does this, that, that, and then you generate the full sequence, and then hopefully uh, do sequence and quality as well. So this sequence that we've generated, is it of a decent quality? Expected results, iterative models that can generate sequences based on guidance, context, le context, context length, independent encoder, as well as having the ability to interpolate between species. So like um, a good example is I want to create a bacteria phage. I have, a, um, I have this phage in E. coli. Can you create a phage similar to the one that works for E. coli, but for this bacteria instead? And then doing interpolations between the the, the bacteria that you have and you can, and then um, and then seeing if that's a phage for you in that instance yeah possible issues safety of course and compete um yes yeah, it's going to require a lot of compete for the larger models even the small models is we're, 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 we're having issues training on all three billion tokens the smaller size is okay because we can do parallel training. However, as we get to like 200 million parameters, it becomes difficult. Uh, although all the data is open source, it's uh, it's not open use, right? So, um, and the difficult thing is it's not um, it's not described in the NCBI datasets whether this specific sequence has the um, has permission for you to train on it. Uh, legal again, similar issues. Um, are we responsible for the output from the for, uh, from the model if someone was to use it for something? Not what it was trained for, and what it was not, not what it was intended for. Similar thing when it comes to ethical. Should we even be training the model in the first place, etc., etc. Hopefully, after the first set of experiments, we'll have a better idea on whether we should go with um, go ahead with this, the scaling. Yeah, great time. Questions, pitfalls, avoid, etc. I may have rushed it, so ask me, um, let me know if I need to go back to any of the slides. Thanks for the talk, Hassan. Do you have any questions? So maybe one, one area, sorry, just hearing an echo from your end, Hassan. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe one area that I'm, that's like closer to this that I've done is the materials discovery, where we're trying to find new materials all the time and like trying to learn from existing material structure and discover new ones or generate new ones. And there, I wonder if it's the same problem here and there is the validation looks easy. You, you got new material and you, from like shapes and all these like things you listed, you can sort of get something that looks right. But then there are further many, many stages of validation when all the way to, towards uh, making the real material and, and all of them would later on fail because it just like it doesn't, it's not sufficient to just look from curves, existing materials. There's so many other stages that you have to pass. Uh, I wonder if this, all these validation methods you listed are just only the first stage and there's like 500 stages afterwards to make a real new DNA. What are your thoughts? Yes, definitely. So essentially our biggest blocker right now, it's not the experiments, although the experiments is what we're getting in terms of the results, it's benchmarking. So that that is genuinely the most difficult aspect of this because you won't know unless you print the, the sequence. And the problem with printing a sequence, it, it's dangerous. And you can't just print every sequence that you have, that you've generated, because again, one of them could be the next coronavirus. One of them could be the next smallpox, et etc. And the, you can't exclude um, the dangerous sequences either, because then you're limiting the amount of space the model has to learn from. So yeah, it's a catch-22. So yeah, generate it. We won't know until the first, the first DNA, um, the first sequences are printed off, if they're even viable. And the problem with even printing off the, um, the sequences, 
specifically with viruses, they mutate so much that you don't know what you printed off is the same as it, it, it. You don't know what you printed off will be um, will actually stay in that structure because again within the first few cells that they replicate in they're going to be completely different they change i think every, every replication one in a thousand one in a thousand basis change and you don't know which one will uh, which one will change so it's something that you started off uh, printing off the that sequence may result in a complete different sequence so yeah what are the different architecture types that you use um, yes. um, so you've got transformer again. That's the Apache architecture. I'm um, based in the Apache architecture. Um, they're on hardware space. Um, for SB state space model, we're using the RWKV. Although we're considering uh, swapping it out with a MAM performer that just came on like a few days ago, um, simply because we already have a, um, a MAM model and we, we we try to make it work. So we're wondering if uh, MAM performer will be better. Again, it's, we'll have to experiment to see which one. And the wavelet is based on the multi multi res convolutional model um, created by someone at Google. I forgot his name. Um, I can link the paper though after. But yeah, so it's just a wavelet uh, model. So it, it, you're looking at the uh, the repetition of sequences both locally and globally using a wavelet uh, equation. And it's just like you have complete networks and then just optimizes based on the wavelet equation. So do you have some benchmarks uh, for the loss and stuff, which uh, performed better and... So we've only done the transformer and we, uh, we've, we've only done the transformer and we've done Mambo. The Mambo wasn't great simply because uh, we started having memory issues at uh, 50 million parameters. Um, and then we just stopped because every time we went up, it's the amount of memory that was required just kept going up because, uh, yeah, because the, um, the Mambo was the, the, the Mambo architecture was, um, the one that we were using was, um, uh, what's it called? Was specific to the data set that they were using, Trend and um, um, I think, is it his name Trend or Dab? I can't remember. But it was, um, it was data set specific um, as well as like um, GPU specific, et cetera. And the GPUs that we have didn't align with theirs, so we started having memory problems, so it's like engineering, engineering issues. But um, in terms of the losses, the transformer performed best. But the uh, the map number wasn't far off. It was like I think um, zero uh, zero point uh, to call it four in terms of losses, which doesn't sound much. But when you're looking at the curve, there's an actual there's a, there is a difference in the slope. Like there is a yeah number does perform worse than um, transformer. Multi-res performs similar to the transformer, but we've only done two five million parameters. We've not scaled it up. Cool. Interesting stuff. Thanks. Any other questions for Hassan? Maybe we'll end here. And uh, all the speakers, I think, have their slides linked on the page. And get in touch if you want to collaborate, ask for the questions, form a relationship, provide support. Thanks again to all the speakers. Great talks. Thank you. See you all next time. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye.